It's an institute that was founded in 1960, so we're 51 years young uh, uh, this year. It was founded by the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations, and it was founded in a very different world than, than we see today. Uh, in 1960, the common wisdom was that much of a Asia was a basket case that uh, there was no way that Asia could feed itself, that we should write off Bangladesh, we should write off India, these guys don't have a prayer. Korea had a GDP that was less than Ghana. Uh, and there were books written. Paul Ehrlich wrote a book, Population Bombs, where he basically laid out the basket case scenario. Uh, the Paddock Brothers wrote a book, his title was Famine 1975. Who will decide? It's America's choice. Who will, who will survive? Um, so the mood was not very good. Uh, but there were some real visionaries in the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation who said, well, that's one vision of the future. It doesn't have to be that way. And uh, the Rockefeller Foundation had the brains. Ford Foundation had the money. They came together and they created Erie. And its mission was to basically uh, change the future through the application of science. And that is, uh, uh, they, they looked at, at the problems in Asia and they saw the only way we're going to uh, in, uh, deal with the problems of Asia is to at least double the production of rice. At that time, uh, the rice, traditional rice varieties were about uh, two meters tall and higher. If you added any fertilizer, they just put on more leaves, grew taller and fell over and you got lower yields. Okay, so the idea was, okay, let's redesign the rice plant and allow the rice plant to take advantage of additional fertilizer, uh, give it a yield potential that it could exploit. And that was a great idea, but nobody knew how to do it. Well, they did it, and, uh, and basically uh, uh, that led to the Green Revolution in, in, in Asia and rice. Uh, that then became the foundation, and I don't think there's any dispute, that, of the great Asian economic miracle. Uh, so our institute, uh, had an early win uh, within a decade, had produced the new rice varieties, the modern uh, plant types, but we just began. Uh, we, we understood that we had to ask the question, okay, if we double rice yields on a, a crop, on a, on a plot of land, and by other changes in technologies, we actually enable a farmer to grow two or even three crops per year instead of one, what will that do to the environmental resource? What will that do to the resource base? Will that destroy the soil? So we started asking questions. So we developed a, we've developed a, a research agenda that's very comprehensive. It looks at, first of all, understanding the genetics of the rice plant. Uh, we have a, a gene bank, which is the world's largest collection of, of rice genetic diversity, 110,000 different representatives. I bet you thought there was only 100 different types of rice. Well, there's 100, you're off by a factor of 1,000. Uh, we have uh, programs that, 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 that look at the uh, managing the natural resource base, net managing water, managing soil, managing uh, uh, fertilizers effectively. We are looking, and as part of that resource, natural resource management component of our program. Most people think of us only as a breeding center, but we do a lot more. We look at greenhouse gas emissions. How can we minimize greenhouse gas emissions? How can we make much more efficient use of our water and, uh, and, uh, and soil fertilizer? Uh, integrated pest management. How can we uh, achieve very high yields of rice uh, without applying uh, unnecessary pesticides or fungicides? We also have a very strong program on social sciences, understanding that rice production is, at the end of the day, a human undertaking. And the way that, 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 that farmers and society uh, uh, behave uh, has a large impact on how much and the quality of, quality of rice that's produced and vice versa. Uh, so we have a very strong social sciences dimension. And we're building a, uh, uh, a stronger uh, program on on uh, rice grain quality. Uh, certainly, make, producing a bigger pile of rice is important, but that pile of rice has got to be something that, that people want to eat. And so it has, and it has to be something that farmers can sell. So that's another dimension. And, and finally, we're also looking at, at 
what the rice of the future will be like. Uh, there, it's, there's no indication whatsoever that rice consumption is going to drop in, to any appreciable degree. We, ex we, we predict uh, uh, increasing consumption um, at a slowing rate, but still an increasing consumption over the next 25 years. But when we look at human diet, and, and we see more and more people becoming urbanized, we look at issues of diabetes. Uh, the way the rice starch is configured, uh, glycemic index, can determine to a large extent what kind of impact this carbohydrate can have on blood sugar levels and type 2 diabetes. So we're looking at questions like that uh, further down the road and uh, as, as we move forward, uh, we have to have, be generating answers to questions that most people won't even be asking for another decade. And I think that's, that's, you know, that's the role of institutions like, like Erie. Um, we were doing work on greenhouse gas emissions from rice paddies in the late 1980s. Now everybody talks about climate change in 2008. Well, 20 years earlier, we were out slogging around the rice paddies asking, well, how much methane actually comes out of these rice paddies? And if you drain the soil and that nitrogen fertilizer you put on, how much of that's going off as, as nitrous, nitrous oxide, another greenhouse gas? So uh, our institution is, 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 is an institution that focuses on issues of poverty and hunger, but we also pay close attention uh, to the environment and we understand that, that, that we have to be the first people to ask very important questions. Uh, and one of the issues we have is that if you're asking questions that people haven't, other pe most people haven't thought of yet, read politicians, sometimes getting funding is, is not as easy as you would like. How does the existing funding structure work now? Well, we, uh, we receive uh, essentially all of our funding from grants, and uh, uh, our current budget's about sixty-five million dollars. And uh, our donor, we, we receive grants from donors. Uh, about twenty percent of what we received in two thousand and ten was what is called unrestricted, which means it goes into a general fund, and we can use that uh, uh, to support various research projects, pay my salary and pay the electricity bill and that sort of thing. And about 80% is from restricted grants. Uh, the problem, now I understand why donors want to give restricted grants because they can track where their dollars go and they can say, okay, my investment made this kind of impact and that's perfectly understandable. Uh, the problem is that when we have almost all of our budget tied up on direct projects with short-term expectations, it becomes increasingly difficult for us to ask exploratory questions and to even begin to, as I mentioned earlier, ask questions that other people haven't thought of yet. And that's what we need the unrestricted funding for, and that's becoming almost non-existent. Now specifically, our support, our largest donor now is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We have uh, uh, significant support from USAID, from the World Bank, from uh, European Union, Australia, Canada. So quite a, quite a mixture of, of, of donors. But uh, our challenge is, in the, in the future, is how can we generate a revenue stream that will allow us to systematically formulate and address long-term questions and challenges and problems without me going out with a begging bowl every January 1st.